All right, let's jump right into the passage here in Matthew chapter 18. Let's look down again at verse number one. I know we just read the entire chapter, but we're going to look here starting in verse number one. The Bible reads, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is asked the question, well, hey, God, you know, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's going to who is the greatest in the, in the kingdom? And he starts off just by answering them. First of all, how do you even get into the kingdom? Right. Like cause that that's really important before you start worrying about who's the greatest. How about like just just entering into the kingdom of heaven? He's like, here's how you enter in. And this is important because the way that you enter in is also related to being the greatest. So the same analogy that he's using ties right in if you want to be the greatest. So look at what he says here in verse number three. Because he says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he says here that we need to become as little children in his analogy. Now, obviously, we could learn a lot just from this section. This isn't the place you're going to go to to try to show somebody how to be saved. But what he's doing is giving us a lot more information in general about being saved and about uh, how we need to be. Uh, you know, obviously, there's more clear statements. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's a, there's a lot of clear statements that we go to to form the doctrine. But once you already have that established, now we go to this other supporting scriptures to be able to build on that. And really what he means about becoming as little children, think about a little child. Think about what, what a little child is like. A little child has to rely on other people to do things for them, right? A, a little child, my children have to rely on me, for example, to go to work. So that way I could provide money to pay for their shelter, to pay for their clothing, to feed them. You know, they don't go off to work in order to be fed every day. They don't go off to do these other things and to try to survive and pay bills and, do, you know, and do all that's required to really even just survive in this world. They have to rely on their parents. And obviously, the younger they are, the more they have to just completely rely. I mean, the newborn babies, your newborn son that you just had, he is completely reliant on his parents. Now, if, if they choose not to care for him and not to do anything for him, then he's just going to die. Like there's no, no getting around. Somebody has to care for that child. That child is extremely humble because it can't do anything for itself. And this is the same attitude that if we're going to enter into the kingdom of God, we can't come with our own righteousness, with our own works, with our own, well, I should be led into heaven. I'm going to enter in the kingdom of God because I've done this and I've done that. No, we need to be reliant on a savior. We need to be able to rely on the father and say, hey, I, I can't do this. So I'm just going to completely, you know, recognize the fact and humble myself and say, I I'm just like a little child. I can't do anything for myself. I can't make my way into heaven. So I'm just going to rely completely on you to allow me into heaven. And this is the point he's just trying to drive because he actually has him bring a little child and puts a little child right in the middle of him. They ask him this question. He's like, hey, bring that bring that little kid over here. Just just to further exemplify what he's trying to teach them. He's like, see this little child, this little child right here. You need to become like this little child in order in the kingdom of God. See, the problem is people think that you need to do all these great things in order to enter into heaven. A little child's not going to be able to do all those great things. There's so many ways that even just this one simple example just, just brings forth so much truth about salvation, about entering into the kingdom of God. That is not some great reward based off of your entire life of achievements. But people who believe in work salvation think that that's the case. It's also not how well you're obedient to God's laws. Children, in general, are not... I mean, they're, they're imperfect, just like so many other people are. But they're humble. They're not lifted up in pride. They're not thinking that they can do everything. They need, they need someone to help them out. Now, and he also brings up humility in the next verse because after he has explained, well, here's how you enter the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. 
They asked, well, who's the greatest? He says in verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he's saying you need to humble yourself. And again, the humility is so low, it's a, the humility of a child. He said, if you, it, you know, you, there is no room. If you want to be greatest, you cannot have any pride at all, because you won't be. If you, if, if you have pride, if you feel like you're lifted up in yourself, say goodbye to being greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For many reasons. I mean, God, God is the first and foremost, God is the one who's going to lift up people and exalt and give honor unto someone. If, if you want to have honor, because what are they saying? If you're greatest, they're looking to see who's going to have the most honor, right? Who is, who is it that's going to be just, just, man, that guy just, just did a lot. And he, you know, you cannot take that honor of yourself. It has to be given to you. Otherwise, it's worthless. If you just think you could rack all that up on yourself and boast about how good you are, you, you don't even have a chance. It has to be given to you. Now, this is also interesting. If you remember back when uh, Jesus said that among them, among men are born, among them are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. But then what he said after he said, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Right? And they're asking, so you could think of, well, John was the greatest man on earth. But the greatest then in heaven is going to be someone who is, and I'm not saying that John wasn't humble, right? But even as good as a person like John the Baptist was compared to those who are in heaven, because, you know, John had the flesh, John had things that were, that were holding him back for being better. Even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Um, and they want to know who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven he says, well, you need to humble yourself as this little child. Now, flip over, if you would, for, uh, to Mark chapter, chapter uh, 9. nine. Mark 9 and 10 give us a little bit more explanation into this same concept. And we're going to see later in Matthew as well um, some more scriptures on, on this topic because it's an important one, just, just, just humility in itself. Pride is such a, huge, such a major sin in the Bible it's covered a lot. It's covered very often. So is humility and the way that we ought to live our life. And actually, everything that we're going to cover in this chapter is all uh, related one to another. It's really interesting. Even though there's separate subjects being brought up, they all are tied together with kind of a central theme that has to do with humility, with just having a humble attitude. We're going to get into forgiveness later. Well, you need to be humble in order to forgive. There's, there's everything that we cover in this chapter is all going to be centralized around this one theme. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse number 33. It's a parallel passage here. The Bible says, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. So obviously this was on their minds, and they're, they're talking about it in Mark chapter 9. And disputing, well, who's going to be the greatest? Like, I wonder, like I'm saying, oh, I'm going to be the greatest. Or if they're saying, like, well, Peter's going to be the greatest. Or John's going to be the greatest, right? They're saying, well, who is this going to be the greatest? And I, I think they were kind of um, maybe embarrassed because they were, they were having that conversation among themselves when Jesus asked them. And they, they, now that they didn't want to say what they were talking about. They're like, hey, what was it that you guys wanted to know? Uh, nothing. <laughs> And then at verse 35, it says, because uh, it says in verse 34, they held their peace. They didn't say anything because that's what they were talking about. In verse 35, it says, And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. The path to becoming first is to become last. That is the way that God operates. That is the way in God's economy how you want to succeed, you want to exceed, you want to become the greatest. And look, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be the greatest, want to be the best Christian, want to be, you know, I don't, that's not like sinful to want to, to have that desire to, to, to be good, to be great, to, to excel. But if you want to know how to do it, it has nothing to do with self-aggrandizement. It has nothing to do with you boasting of yourself and, and putting it forward that you are some great person and some, some godly person. The way that you do that is by becoming the most humble person 
and literally being completely selfless. And Jesus was the example. That's why Jesus has a name which is above every name, right? Jesus came and allowed his name to be despised and himself to be spit on and beaten and mocked and ridiculed and just made as the off-scouring of the world. And, but in so doing, he's going to have a name which is above all names and, and receive the honor due to him. Jonathan, sit still and pay attention. Flip over to Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. We're going to read again, in, or I'm excuse me, Mark, Mark, Mark chapter 10. Mark 9, you're in Mark 9, you should just flip over to Mark chapter 10. Because Jesus said, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. You need to be a minister. You need to be able to serve other people. When you're proud, when you're lifted up, you think you're so great, you're not considering yourself being a servant. I mean, just think of any person in this world that's just thinking really highly of themselves. What type of attitude they have? Are they going to be the first person? If you think really highly of yourselves and you're walking around with that type of an attitude, are you going to be the person that's going to go and, you know, take someone's shoes off and wash their feet or, or just do anything, go and be a servant and serve other people. No. These are going to be the people that are going to walk in and expect to be served. They're going to expect to be waited on. They're going to walk in the door and be like, where's my seat? They're going to walk into the restaurant and just, just start talking down to people and just being like, yeah, give me my seat because they feel like I am so special. I am great. I deserve this. You all need to be waiting on me. That's not the way God operates. He says, no, you need to be servant of all. You need to be the one just doing the serving and, and not looking to yourself to be lifted up. Mark uh, chapter 10, verse 42, the Bible reads, But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. He's saying this is the way it is out in the world. The people who are great and, and looked on as these great people, they are exercising authority over other people. They are exercising lordship over the other people and, and putting these people to work and having them underneath them and they're sitting up in these high positions. He says, but so shall it not be among you. He's saying that's the way the world operates, but that's not the way that I want you to operate. He says, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And I went over this on Sunday as well. You know, we're talking about the, the titles of, of a pastor in a church. We don't use the word reverend because reverend belongs unto God, but we do use the word minister, right? Because that is appropriate for somebody who's in the ministry, for someone who does pastor to be a minister and to serve other people. Now, while there is a responsibility and a role of being an overseer and looking out for things and managing things, the Bible is very clear that the, the pastor or the elder is not to lord over the people. Jesus is referring to the Gentiles and to the world as they lord over people. That's how they exercise their authority, but that's not the way things are supposed to run in the church. You are supposed to be able to, you know, Every Christian in general, but especially, you know, when it comes to a pastor, you shouldn't have someone that's just lording over and telling everyone else what to do. They should be leading by example. Now, again, there is an authority behind the position and, and there is a management and things that need to be run. But at the same time, the job consists of service, serving, helping others, doing good, and, and ultimately just doing the most to be the biggest servant that you can be. And that is how God is going to view you as being great. When you, are, when you think of yourself as just being, how can I help everyone else? And then actually following through with that, it's not enough just to have the attitude. You need to, to, ha to, to put that into action. To be of service to other people. And, and just so everybody here knows, you know, Part of my job is I'm here to help you. So when people in church need something, if you have a problem, if you, have, if you need counsel, if, you, if, if there's whatever in your life and, and you're having issues and you're having problems, you can come to me and I'm here to help you. 
And you know, you should be able to go to other people in church as well because hopefully everybody here is embracing the mindset of being servants, of being ministers, of being there to help others. That is what's different about God's church is that this is the way he wants it to operate. You're not thinking, oh, well, let me do everything for myself first and then I'll do something for you. It's, oh, you need something? I'll help you out right away. Yeah, I have other things planned, but I'll put that on the back burner. I'll help you out. You need something? I'll help you. That is the mindset. And this is the way that God is going to view people who are going to be great in the kingdom of heaven. He says in verse uh, 43, But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And he just brings up the fact that, you know, even the Son of God, even Jesus Christ himself, our example came not to have everybody do things for him, but to do things for everyone else. He came to die for the sins of the whole world, for everybody. Not only that, he came and he healed the sick and he, and he you know, gave, blind, gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and, and, and you know, the lame to walk and all these great things of just service and help and goodness and giving of himself and not getting sleep and fasting and praying and all that he did. It wasn't for himself. It was for everybody else. Even just the fact that Jesus Christ came to this baby, came to this, came to this world and humbled himself as a little child. God became a man incarnate. Talk about the, the love and humility there to allow himself to... to experience what we experience as his creation and, and go through everything and, and show us this is, this is the way that we're supposed to live. This is what we're supposed to do. And if, it's, and if, if it wasn't too low for him to do, then who do you think you are <laughs> to not follow in those steps? Do you think you're that much better than Jesus? Oh, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't do something that low and that degrading. Well, look at what Jesus did. He's our Savior. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 18. So he gives us that teaching of, of what we need to do to be greatest. One, to get into the kingdom of heaven. Two, then to be greatest. It's still, it's embracing it's embracing what you needed to do to get in. First, you, need to get, you just need to be humble. You need to, you need to recognize and put your faith in God and trust in Him. And then two, it's retain that humility and now just, just help other people. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five, the Bible reads, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Here we get to see a little insight. And, and you know, I was considering, I, I might end up still preaching on this anyways and the characteristics of God, but what a great characteristic of God. You know, oftentimes in Baptist churches and in our church are going to, you know, scream a lot about sin and, and we need to have a proper, healthy fear of the Lord. And that's going to be covered a lot, right? Because we need to get our act together. But on the, on the flip side of that, you know, obviously we have a fear of God. Look at what Jesus is saying here about someone who offends one of these little ones that believe in him. His little children, right? We have the advantage of being children of God who's going to look out for us and protect us. Yeah, he's going to keep us in line, but he's also there to protect us and say, don't, don't mess with my children, don't touch my children because I'm going to protect them and I'm going to look out for them. And what a great comfort that is for us to know, man, we're, I'm a child of God. I mean, you think about it, with your own children, you know, I raise my children, hey, they need to have a proper fear of dad. 
You know, I want them doing what's right all the time. But at the same time, hey, watch out for anyone who wants to try to put their hands on my children. But they better watch out. And my children can rest easy knowing that I won't tolerate it for a second. I mean, someone comes in here and tries to do any harm or damage to my family, to my kids, <laughs> watch out. They're not messing around with that. And Jesus didn't mess around with that either. Jesus went so far as to say, you know what? If someone wants to try to offend, and you know, offend is like making an offense against, you want to offend one of these little ones that believe in me? Think about getting a millstone, which is huge rock, right? A huge stone. He's like, tie that around your head, around your neck, and just throw them off into the sea. I mean, does anyone want that to happen? Uh, is, that, is that a way that anyone wants to die? It's like putting a hit out on somebody. And Jesus is saying, you know what? That's better. That would be better for you. You want to offend one of these little ones that believe in me? And then you think about these perverts and these pedophiles that go out there and defile children. What a warning from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ isn't, he doesn't just make like empty threats. He's not just trying to sound tough and be like this tough guy, like these keyboard warriors out there. Oh, I'm going to do this and this to you and you're dead. And you, you, know, you blow hearts. You're not going to do anything. But you know who is? Jesus will. You know, I'm going to take Jesus at his word on this where he says it's gonna, it would be better for you to just be drowned with a millstone hanging around your neck and be thrown into the sea than what I'm going to do with you if you offend one of these little ones. That is some wrath you don't want to face. And you know what? As a child of God, we get to just have comfort in knowing that God is there to, to right every wrong, to be a God of vengeance, and to, and to watch over us and protect us. And if anyone's going to do wrong, that they're going to get that. Now, obviously here he's saying, one of these little ones which believe in me. I think you could, you know, you could further apply that a little bit more to people who, who believe in Christ. But he, I mean, he's talking about the little children that believe in him. It's like, don't mess with them. Verse number seven. He says, woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. He's like, that's just the way it is in this world. There's people that, that do bad things. And it's going to happen. Jesus needed to be crucified. Jesus needed to be portrayed. That's something that just had to happen in order to bring our salvation. But he says here, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. <laughs> but woe on you. Don't you be that man. Some People are going to do it. People are going to do some really wicked things. People are going to do some bad things because they've been given free will. But woe to that man that does those wicked things. Watch out. And, and you know, people need to just read the Bible and take heed to these warnings and be like, I don't want to be that man. Verse number eight. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. So he brings up, so, you know, why is it better to have a millstone hanged about your neck and to be cast into the sea? Because God's judgment is hell. It's eternal torture and torment. And in Mark, it, it goes further in the same passage, talking about where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, just to give that little extra detail on how bad hell is. And here he's saying, you know what? It's way better for you if you had to cut off your hands and cut off your feet and pluck out your eyes. All of that is better than going to hell. That's how bad hell is. Just so people understand, no, hell is really, really, really bad. And hell is not just separation from God. Oh, well, God's just going to be over there and I'm going to be over here. and I'm just going to wish I was with God. No, it's worse than taking a knife and plucking out your own eyeball. It's worse than, worse than taking a saw and chopping off your hand. Okay, burning in a lake of fire forever 
and the smoke of your torment is going up forever and ever and ever and you have no rest day nor night and you're screaming and in darkness and in pain and, and all you're going to hear is other people in the same torture and torment? Yeah, that's hell. It's more than just some separation from God. It is eternal suffering and vengeance and torture. Not a place you want to be at all. So yeah, compare that to anything that physically can happen to you on earth. Yeah, I'll take anything physically that's going to happen to me on earth to not go to hell. And that's what he's teaching here. Like, don't, you know, if there's anything that's going to keep you from going, if you have to take some drastic measure, it would be worth it. Verse number 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. And I, and I talked about this when I, when I preached on angels, I don't know, it was a while ago. But um, the Bible teaches us that angels are ministering spirits sent to minister unto us, unto the believers, unto the sons of God. Which is another really comforting thing to know is that God has these creatures these beings that one of their jobs is to minister and to help to serve children of God, to serve us. And he's saying to, to beware about doing anything and hating the little ones that believe in him. He says, because they're angels. So the people that the angels that he has set to, to watch over and to minister to those little ones, He's like, they're always beholding the face of my Father which is in heaven. And they're ready. If God says, go, take care of that, they'll do it. And God's will will be done. And, and you know, these people who, who think they can just go and offend one of those little ones, they're going to find out that, that God is serious about, about his, uh, his promises here. Verse number 11, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye? If a man have an hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And again, he brings up these, these little ones. God has a lot of love for them, but he brings up also this analogy of, um, you know, someone who has a hundred sheep. Hey, if one of them gets lost, one of them is, is, loses their way, he's going to leave the other ones there and go and retrieve the one that's, that's gotten away, that's gotten out. Why? Because he cares about them. He loves them. He wants them to come back. He wants them to come back into the fold. Uh, flip over, if you would, to Luke chapter 15. We're going to see another reference here. And he cares so much, too, in, in Matthew 18. He, he cares so much, it says that... Um, if so be they find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Like it, it, it really is great news to be able to bring that one back, to find that sheep and to bring them back. The other ninety nine, it's not that he doesn't care about them, but it, it's such a big deal to be able to retrieve that one that's lost. Like it's such a joyous occasion to have them come back and be like, great. You know, he's happy that these other ones are, are they don't need to go and, and, and be found. They're already there. But the one that, you know, that, that he's able to bring back, hey, that's, that's a really joyous occasion. And you see something similar with the uh, prodigal son as well, right? We see the story of the prodigal son where the one son stays behind. He's doing the work. He's obeying his father. He's, he's doing everything he's supposed to be doing. The other son goes off, wastes his life with, with riotous living and, and gets himself in all kinds of trouble and wastes all of his substance and really makes a big waste of his life and gets into sin and is just a big disappointment to the family name. But when he ends up coming back, hey, dad's excited. He's thrilled. He's happy. Hey, let's have a party. He's back. He lost his way. He was out. 
you know, doing whatever, but he's back. This is great. This is exciting. Let's throw a feast for him. And, you know, that's when uh, the brother's like kind of sulking a little bit going, hey, you know, I, I didn't, I've been working for you all this time. He goes and does all this stuff. And now you're, you're making this big party for him. He's like, we never, we've never even had a kid to celebrate and have our own party. He's like, son, you know, we, this is appropriate. What you tell him. And I'm summarizing, obviously, the whole parable. He says, you know, it's appropriate to do this. It's right for us to, to be happy about him coming back. That's great. He says, but basically, he's going to get back to work and he doesn't have any more inheritance. He, he's wasted his, his inheritance. He's wasted his reward. Yeah, he's, he's in the family. He's still here. He's going to stay in the family. He was, he was a son. He's never, he, never, he doesn't lose his sonship. But you, you're going to get all of this stuff. <laughs> you're going to reap all of this stuff. So don't worry about the, you know, yeah, it's appropriate to be happy he's come back. But, but don't lose sight of the bigger picture. That's what he's saying. And we ought not to lose sight of that as well. We need to keep uh, pushing forward and working for the Lord. Look at Luke 15, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now, I personally think that you can look at these passages in, in two different ways and apply them uh, either way and obviously there's different contexts given the different passages because he says these he's using the same parable in, in different times in his ministry in different contexts but the one is what I was kind of talking about of, of a sheep just being you know losing its way like the prodigal son and then returning right and and that's that's great news but it's but that context that I was referring to isn't necessarily someone who's unsaved it's someone who's saved they lose their way they've gone away from the flock but then they come back that's exciting that's great news we always want to see that and you know what that's the attitude we ought to have here too this ties in with being humble as you continue to go to church, you come to church, you come to a good church, you're going to see people come and go. And you're going to see people get on fire for God, people you're going to love and, and respect and, and work with and, and go soul winning with. They're going to fall by the wayside and kind of get, get distracted by the cares of this world. It's going to happen. It happens all the time. But we don't want to get our, let ourselves get lifted up that when that person wants to come back and, and decides to show back up, that we just look down and, oh, man, well, where have you been? Just give them a real hard time instead of just being humble enough to be like, hey, and, and rejoice and be like, wow, you're, hey, great. It's great to see you. Th you know, hope everything's been well. I'm glad you're here. You know, you don't have to, to rub their face in anything. If they might have gone off in the sand or something wrong, if they're back, they've repented, they're, they're good to go, then amen and amen, we should be rejoicing over that as well. Amen. And that is a great attitude to have, and we ought to be like that. Even if someone falls under the category of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and they need to be kicked out of the church, and you need to put that evil person, that wicked person away from among you because they're in some really bad sin and they know better, if they repent, they get right with God, we're going to welcome them right back in and not hang anything over their head because that's what we're supposed to do. Now, the other way, that was the one way of viewing that parable. I think the other way is looking at it as people who are just unsaved out in the world to go and to seek and to save those that are lost because they're, they're blinded, they're lost. And um, obviously we know that, that there is rejoicing also when somebody gets saved. That is a, that's a huge deal. And it's something also to rejoice over. So I, I you know, I kind of, I don't mind hearing both ways of, of understanding that passage because he's not I mean it, 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 anytime you have a parable you're gonna have you know it's usually unless Jesus goes then and explains exactly what he means 
there's going to be a, some openness to, to really applying it and applying it appropriately, making sure you get it right. It's harder to be dogmatic about those, especially when you've got two views that are just completely true, that they're, they're both true statements, true doctrines, whatever, and then, and then you're looking at the parable to try to apply it. I don't think either one, and, and also with parables as well, you know, you can't look and focus too much on every single little detail because it's just an illustration, just an example. Every example falls short to some degree or another. All of them do. But they're meant for a purpose. So like when we give, when we give the example of, of showing someone salvation is like a free gift, right? It's great because it teaches that you're not buying for, you're just receiving it for free, you're taking ownership of it, whatever, right? There's a lot of good things you can learn from that. But does that just embody everything about salvation just completely perfectly that there's you know, because what about people say, well, what if I give it to someone else? What if I throw it away? What if I give it back? Like, that's not the way it works. Right. right? So obviously at some point, every example is going to fall short. It's not going to completely just be exactly what these spiritual things are. Right. And it's similar with apparel. So don't, don't get too focused on with a magnifying glass on, on every little tiny detail in a parable. Focus on the main portion of what he's trying to get across and what he's trying to teach because you can you can really find yourself getting into weird false doctrine when you start looking too close and trying to apply things that just really aren't there and wasn't the point of the parable to begin with the vast majority of false doctrines that are out there among Christians or people who call themselves Christians is a result of misinterpreting parables instead of going with clear statements Anyway, let's go back to Matthew chapter 18. Look at verse number 15. Now we're going to get into a portion of Scripture here that has to deal with conflict among brethren, among people who are saved. And what is the appropriate way to deal with this conflict? Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, Thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Heaven. Now, this is important to understand what this is because there's a lot of people who don't understand how to, how to just understand the Bible and apply the Bible appropriately. There are many different things that can happen where judgment might fall upon a believer, but they don't all fall into this particular category of, well, you have to do all of these steps, and if you don't, you're not being consistent with the Bible, and you're not obeying God's Word. If it's found out that somebody is a drunkard, for example, and I already mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if Brother Brian or Brother Evan has found out that they're just a drunkard, you know what, both of these guys, they've been saved long enough, they've been coming to church long enough, they know, they... Better know <laughs> at this point, right, that it's wicked to be a drunk, to be a drunkard. I'm not saying if someone saw them, you know, have a beer, which again is wicked. They shouldn't be doing that. But if it's found out that they're a drunk, that they're going out every weekend and getting drunk and partying it up and that that's just, you know, they, there's these, these drunks. We're not going to, oh, I'm going to approach him one-on-one, -on -one, and then if they don't listen, we're going to get more people involved, and then, and then we're going to bring it forward. No. If that's found out and it's true, they're just gone. We're putting the wicked people away from among us. We're not doing a vote. We're not doing anything else to rectify those types of situations. We don't need to. Those that are, that are causing divisions that the Bible says we're supposed to mark and avoid the people that are sowing discord, you're out. This is a different situation. This is talking about, and if we look at the, at the very first part of the, the passage in verse 15, 
He says, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So what do we have here? We have somebody doing wrong to someone else by sinning against them. This is a personal matter. If there's people in a church and you have a brother in Christ that sins against you, someone does you wrong. This is how you deal with it. He says the first thing that you do is you try to deal with that person alone. There's no reason. And again, and people need to, this is serious. There's no reason to start going around and talking to other people about what this person did to you. Okay, that is not going to help the situation at all, and it's not the right way of doing it. Can you believe, brother, can you believe he did that to me? Look, if someone does you wrong, be a man and approach that person and confront them about whatever it is that you think they did wrong to you and just try to work it out. Amen. Try to deal with it and, and, and do it in a way where no one else even has to know about it. Because that's the way that the Bible's telling us to deal with these things. And he says, hey, and that's why he says, go and tell his fault between thee and him alone. Alone. Right. Just talk about it alone. No one else, you don't need to get witnesses. No one else has to be there. First, you try to deal with thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, so if he's like, oh man, you're right. I didn't realize that. Or, or yeah, you know, I was having a bad, whatever. If he hears thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Amen. Everything's good. Okay. But if he will not hear thee, he says, then take with thee one or two more. So he's saying, okay. Now we're going to get some, some other people who are going to be good people in the church. Good people are going to listen, you know, and it says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Why? Because normally if someone does something wrong, excuse me, to someone else, there's usually going to be some conflict of, I didn't say that, I didn't do that, and, you know, and there's this kind of, he said, she said, and this back and forth type of arguing of, of just not even agreeing on the facts. And when you have two or three witnesses there, they can help establish every word. Okay, this person said this and this and this, you know, kind of help get to the bottom of the situation and, and really just help mediate, right? Help, help figure out what are the facts, what actually happened here, and still just, just try to make things smooth over, find a solution that everyone's agreeable to and just, and just be done with it because we want to be able to exist in unity as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the goal. That's what we want to be able to do. But sometimes, you know, people will wrong you and it's not a sin or wrong to ask that person to make it right. I mean, if someone damages your property or something like that, there's nothing wrong with wanting that person to compensate you for what they did if they, I mean, if, if I back up my car and I, and I just, I accidentally hit the gas instead of the brake and I smash into someone else's car, you know, why should that person just have to bear the brunt and all the financial responsibility of my mistake? I should be able to own up to it and say, okay, well, um, you know, what, whatever, the, whatever the agreement can be to try to make it right is what that person should do. Now, the Bible also teaches, you know, allow, you can allow yourself to be defrauded, allow yourself, that's the, the best spirit to have is one of just like, well, you know, I'll, I'll just allow this to happen. If they're going to be a jerk to me, you know, if they're, if they're not going to recognize, then okay, you know, but you don't have to do that. It's not, it's like, it, it's not wrong to be like, well, look, I need to get to work. Okay, and I don't have any money to get another vehicle and, and this needs to be taken care of and I just, I can't do it. Like, I, I need you to, to help out here. You, 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 you did wrong. And he says, this is how you deal with it. So you just go and try to, try to remedy it. Now, what we don't do though is we don't take brother to law with brother. I mean, if in that situation, you don't just go and sue them. That's not right. 
you try to deal with it and you deal with it in-house. You deal with it with you and him alone and then you can bring a couple more people in. And then, and here's the thing, and here's what's important about this as well. It says, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, I mean, he's actually done you wrong. This isn't just someone said something that you don't like and you're kind of offended at, at whatever about that person. This isn't petty things like that. Okay, this is an actual offense. I mean, this is something that you could look to and be like, yeah, they've trespassed against me. Right? And they've actually violated me somehow. Right? There's an actual real event. Because that's why then at the end of this, you'll see, you know, okay, if the two or three witnesses doesn't work, then it says if you neglect to hear them, because this is talking about the person who's done the wrong. If the person who's done the wrong just is not willing to accept that they've done wrong, he says, then you tell it to the church. Okay, I mean, we, we've been going back and forth. Now we're going to let the whole church know what's going on here so that we can make a decision about this. Is, but if you neglect to hear the church, you're saying if the whole church is like, look, you, you're wrong. He says, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Because that's wicked. Because of the person to do wrong, to just have that stiff neck, and not do what's right and not own up and take responsibility for your own actions, that's wicked. Amen. And then he says, you know what? Let him be unto thee a heathen and a publican. And he, and he continues on with this passage, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I told you a couple weeks ago that I was going to come back to this. This is where this is mentioned. And this gives us a better context, kind of a more complete context than we saw in Matthew 16. And what he's referring to here is the flexibility and the things that, that the church has responsibility over, that God has given authority over to deal with, he outlines how to deal with it, but at the end of the day, whatever the judgment is of the church, God says, you know what, I'll abide by that too. So if you find somebody has trespassed against someone else, and this is what you say that needs to be remedied, and this is how they need to do it, this is the, 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 the proper judgment, then God says, I'll stand by that. You bind, what is happening? You're binding something on earth, and God says, okay, that's bound in heaven. And on one hand, it's really cool because God's like got our back to deal with things and to manage them and to, and to be able to do that. But on the other hand, it's also a lot of responsibility because you want to make sure you're doing right things. You want to have righteous judgment. But, um, and then at the end of the day, and, and just think about that too. If you're, if you're someone who do, who do, who's done something wrong and you don't want to fess up to it and there's a judgment against you, you can say, well, I'll just, you know, they're not, I know they're not going to sue me at the law, right? So forget them, and I'll just leave the church and whatever. Well, hold on a second there, Slick, because God said that whatever they bind on earth, he's binding in heaven. You think you're going to get away from God's judgment? I think you'd be better off just paying whatever, or do, you know, like just, just, following through with the judgment of the church because God will make sure that that judgment comes back on you and he may even double it or make it sevenfold. You know, who knows? Amen. For adding sin upon sin, for, for, for just completely ignoring the judgment that's already been bound. And, and this is why, you know, consider, hopefully no one's ever going to be doing wicked things, other people or other brothers in Christ, but, but don't forget that. Don't forget this teaching. Now, don't think that, like, well, there's nothing they could do anyways, really. Because there is something that God can do. And, and God is a judge, and he's a righteous judge. In, um, of course, the, the reference, though, to things being bound on earth and heaven is in Matthew 16, verse 18, where he said, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The reason why I wanted to wait it is because I wanted to wait for to teaching on this a little bit further. Is because in Matthew 18 we see more context of an actual example and how this binding of things in earth and heaven pertains to the how it pertains to church, right? Because he references he's building his church, and then he references things being bound in heaven and on earth. 
and then we see a more explicit, clear example of how that works. This is one of the examples of how that actually plays out. The authority that God has given to the church to make judgment calls, it stands. It stands not just here on earth, it stands in heaven as well. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 19 in Matthew chapter 18. The uh, Bible reads, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, this has been a really abused verse by people who want to not go to church and do their little house church and, and say, oh, I could just worship at home and I can do all this stuff at home. I don't need to go to church. What is the church anyways? The Bible says we're two or three to gather together in my name. There am I in the midst. Yeah, but it doesn't say you're in church. Where two or three are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, he says he's in the midst. Amen. Amen. And in the context here, he's talking about agreeing as touching anything on earth because we were just talking about judgment and things being bound in heaven and earth. And he's saying that basically he's going to confirm when you've got two or three people agreeing on this and saying, yeah, this is the judgment. This is what needs to happen. This is bound in heaven. I'm right there in the midst. I'm another witness for you. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, well, we're two or three gathered together, then you've got a bishop and an elder and a deacon, and that, well, there's three, right? So you've got, you've got those people there, and there's your church. And the elder teaches the deacon. Because there's two of you, and then Jesus is in the midst, and there you go, and you can just sit at home. No, actually, it's called your family. <laughs> when you're just at home, and you think that that's church because you get out a songbook and sing or you read the Bible. We have Bible time every night in my house. But that's not church. <laughs> we don't have church every night. We sing hymns at home. I'm even the pastor of a church. But that's not church. Right. Now look, there was a time where I had people congregating in my house and that was church. It's not the building or the location that matters. It's the congregation that makes it a church. It's the assembling of yourselves together, not just something that you do every single day anyways. You can't just call something you do every day, like have dinner with your family or read the Bible, church. That's not church. Now, if you have people assembling, other believers, other Christians assembling at a house, great. You can call that church. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't just say, well, church is just, you know, just so loose with this definition. Well, it's church when, when me and my friend talk about the Bible. No, that's not church. That can be called fellowship or a discussion with your friend. It's not church. It, it, it's one of those things, it's actually pretty irritating when you hear people that are so ignorant. And, and really all it is, the, it, these are just, when you find these really lame excuses for things, it's really all it is is an excuse. It's people who, who don't want to recognize their sin, who don't want to acknowledge what the Bible says and just try to come up with any reason they can to do what they want to do instead of just being truthful and honest with what God's Word says and teaches. Because there is no way you can get around church being a congregation, regardless of where it meets, whether it meets in a synagogue or whether it meets in a house, doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that when there's elders, when, when, when a church, a group of people, a congregation doesn't have an elder, there's something wanting, there's something lacking. It needs to be there. And there's qualifications set forth to have an elder or a bishop. These house churches, these people who don't want to actually walk into a building like ours, because it's just so much different than a house, right? If you actually walked into a building that has bricks on it and, and whatever, it has, it's, it's a little bit bigger of a space and there's no bedrooms, okay? Why is that so much different? I don't know. 
They're focused too much on the building. Yep. Well, it has to be a house. No, it doesn't. And I guarantee you that even though there were churches meeting in people's houses, in, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, or in the, you know, they weren't all meeting in houses. There were too many people getting saved to fit in a living room and not enough people to teach all of those people that you just have a pastor for every 10 people. Sorry, not buying it. No way. No way you're getting thousands saved on a day and expect me to believe that there are people that are not novices that are all ready to go and just teach all of these little tiny cells and groups in people's houses and do these, these home group studies like the Jehovah's Witnesses, Witnesses do and call that church and think that that was church in the New Testament. No. People were gathering together in whatever space would accommodate them. And we don't see a lot about that because it doesn't matter what the space was. There were churches meeting in synagogues. They're already meeting in synagogues. And if the people were saved, and if you had to be, you know, as the New Testament began, as the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it makes sense. I mean, people who were believing in the Lord before Jesus came, right? I mean, was there anybody saved before Jesus came? Yeah. Were, were they meeting places? Doesn't it make sense that the same people would probably continue to meet in the same places after Jesus rose again from the dead? I mean, assuming that they were already among believers? Of course. And they were meeting in synagogues. So why would they all of a sudden be like, okay, scrap this. Now we're just going into my house. That wouldn't make any sense. But that whole stupid doctrine doesn't make any sense anyways. Let's, uh, let's finish off here on the last passage in Matthew chapter 18. So the rest of this passage talks about forgiveness. And I didn't give myself enough time to do justice to forgiveness. There's a lot of verses here, but I'm going to do my best to, to get through this. So look at verse number 21. The Bible says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, I want to make a point about this and turn, if you would, really quickly to Luke chapter 17. Because as we take teachings in the Bible as a whole in context and understand what it's talking about, there's, there's actually, a, I think, a lot of Christians who don't understand what God expects about forgiveness on, on two different fronts. One, there's a teaching here, of course, of humility, of being able to be sinned against over and over again and still being able to forgive that person who's done you wrong, right? That is an attitude of humility. That is an attitude that God says, no, you know, there's not like a number limit on how many times someone sent you where you're supposed to be able to forgive them. However, there does, there ought to be repentance involved for the forgiveness, I've seen things on the opposite extreme of this where people are like, you know, some serial killer kills their child and, and does horrible things to them and they're like, well, I forgive them. And they're just like, I don't even care. And they can explain it and describe it and revel in it. And they're like, well, I forgive them anyways. Look, no, no. And you don't, you don't have to and God's not expecting you to forgive me. You know what? God's not going to forgive that person. So, I don't think you ought to forgive that person. Now, we ought to have a lot of forgiveness, right? And we ought to be able to be quick and ready to forgive. We saw that again as well earlier from Jesus Christ. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to hear. He's ready to reach out his hand. But it requires something of you first. And that's why you turn to Luke 17, because again, there's another parallel for the same teaching. Look at verse number three in Luke 17. The Bible says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. 
So there he says, look, if he repents, then forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. This is the commandment of, look, you need to forgive him. It is incumbent upon us if someone sins against you, but then they repent, right? And they're sorry and they come to you and say, look, I repent. I was wrong. We have to forgive them. That is what we are supposed to do. I mean, that is what God's Jesus is teaching us, saying, look, you have to do this. But it's not the same if someone's not repentant. If someone's just completely not repentant and just saying, no, I'll do it again. You're not under obligation to forgive that person. Now, you can. It's a free, you know, you, you, that's, not, that's not necessarily sinning to, to, to forgive somebody who's not repentant, but all throughout Scripture, what do we see from God? There is a condition to receive forgiveness. There is always a condition to receive forgiveness. Always. Nobody is pardoned for their sins without the repentance of believing on Jesus Christ. Nobody is. There is no forgiveness. And after you're saved, there's no forgiveness, there's no automatic forgiveness if you're having a stiff neck and not listening to God and just willfully sin. There's no forgiveness. Even if it's not willful, there's no just, just automatic forgiveness, I'm saying apart from your eternal salvation, where God's just going to not allow you to reap what you've sown. Without repentance. See, if you repent, if you get right, if you say, whoa, whoa hold on a second, you know, then you will find forgiveness. And you see that all Genesis to Revelation, people repenting and then receiving forgiveness. It is the same thing with us. I mean, it's the same exact teaching. He's not expecting us to be any different in that regard. So when he's telling Peter here about, uh, you know, until seven times, he says until 70 times seven, it's, I would say it's inferred based on all the other readings and passages in scripture that he's talking about people who repent. Because that's why they're having the opportunity to be forgiven over and over and over again. It's not someone who's just continually sinning against you and not being repentant at all and just, just, you know, causing offense, causing offense, causing offense. And they're not even sorry for it at all. Like, he's not just saying, well, just forgive, 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 forgive. No, he's saying <laughs> the guy does you wrong and then says, oh, man, I'm sorry, man, I didn't mean to do that. So, okay, please forgive me. Okay, forgive him. And then he does the same thing again. Like, man, I don't know what I was thinking. I did it again, you know. I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm going to try not to do that anymore. And then he does it again. You know, it, it's okay. You, you keep forgiving that person. As long as they're repentant, you forgive. But without that repentance, it's, you're not under any obligation. But with the repentance, you are under obligation. And don't forget that either. You know, don't, don't be so proud, right? Lack the humility to be able to say, I forgive you. And not just say it, but honestly forgive people in your heart. People can do some hurtful things to you. And you might want to carry a grudge and just, and just hold that against people. If they repent, you are obligated to forgive them. And hey, great lesson, husbands and wives. Because there's going to be problems. There's going to be fights and people are going to say some nasty things to each other. Because that's what happens. Because we're sinners and we say things that we ought not sometimes. And then you ought to be careful with what you say. But when your spouse who's, who's said something wrong to you or done something wrong to you and they turn to you and they repent and they're like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't mean that. You have to forgive them. You have to forgive them. And you know what? That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. I'm glad that God, that Jesus is saying you have to forgive them. And, and just take a step back and think about all you've been forgiven of. 
And this is what we're going to get into in, with the rest of this passage because he gives this example of just like, you know, here's someone who's forgiven of all this stuff and they're not going to go and, and forgive the smallest infraction against them. Humble yourself a little bit and remember all that you've been forgiven of before you just have this hard line with people who do you wrong. Look at verse number 23. The Bible says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. 10,000 talents is a lot of money. This is a big debt. I mean, it's so big, he basically has to sell off his entire family would be the only way to try to satisfy this debt. He's saying, you're all going into bondage. You all are just, just going to go into slavery and, and you belong to me because you didn't, I mean, you owe all this money. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. So he's asking for mercy and willing to pay back the debt. He's got this attitude of, of you know, wanting to do right, right? Verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So then the Lord says, all right, you know, he, he, he feels sorry for him. He can see, it looks like this guy is very repentant, you know, and, and he just forgives him and says, fine. You, you, don't, you don't have to pay that back, right? But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And I know this isn't the monetary system that we're, we're familiar with today, but a hundred pence is like such a small fraction of the 10,000 talents. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like, let's just say, instead of calling them talents, call them dollars. So you say you owe $10,000 to somebody, which 10,000 talents is way more than that. But let's just say you owe $10,000 to someone and you're like, someone owed you a dollar. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's a similar type of, a, of a equ equivalence here. Right? I mean, it's, it's just like, or someone owes you 50 bucks or whatever. It's like, really? Like you, you just owed 10 grand to somebody and you're going to just give this, this hard line with this guy who's owed him 100 pence. Says, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. That's, that's pretty serious. I mean, that, that's, that is unmerciful. You're taking him by the throat. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet. So look, now, now the roles are reversed, right? Because remember, this guy was going to be sold into slavery with all of his, his family. You're going to be a bond servant. Your, your children, your wife, you're all going to have to serve now. He fell down at his feet. Now this guy's fallen down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. So now this guy's having a good attitude. Now look, he owed him in fair and square. I mean, he owed him, right? This was a debt that he owed and he's supposed to pay. But now he's seeking mercy and going, hey, look, I'll pay you. Just, just give me a little bit of time, right? Just, just hold on a minute here. But look what it says here in verse 30. And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. No mercy, no forgiveness, nothing. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord what, that what was done. They, these other guys saw it like, whoa, that's messed up. <laughs> I mean, just, this is just, I cannot believe that this guy did that and had him thrown in prison after everything that just happened. Like, that's crazy. So they go back and tell the Lord that he had owed the 10,000 talents to like, Look, look at what this guy did. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So he's saying here, now look, and this is again where people will get into false doctrine because they take these parables, they take these stories, and they say, see, you can lose your salvation. 
And if you're not forgiving everyone that does you wrong, then God's going to send you to hell. That's not what he's teaching here. I understand he uses the word tormentors. But tormentors doesn't automatically just mean he's talking about hell. He's talking about just exacting the payment that needs to be paid. And yeah, it's, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pleasant going through that. But what he's teaching here, and this is, this is again, all throughout Scripture as well, that we're going to reap what we sow. And the, and the level that the, like our judgment, the way we judge others, is going to be judged upon us. Same thing with forgiveness. He's saying, you know, when someone comes to you and is, is asking for mercy and is repentant and, and they need forgive, you know, forgive them. Forgive them. Because the mercy that you show to them, God's going to extend unto you. But then on the, on the flip side, you're going to be hard like that against these people? Well, guess what? God's going to be hard like that for you. And the reason he's given here, he's like, look, shouldest thou not have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? So what we need to remember in the likeness is when you just think about all of the forgiveness that you've received, do not have that hard attitude against other people who are repentant towards you. Forgive them. And he says, if ye fr if from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother that trespasses. It, he expects it to be real. Not just lip service. Honestly forgive. You know what happens when you forgive somebody? You forget it. You don't ever bring it up again. Because if you keep bringing something up that supposedly you forgave someone for, you didn't really forgive them. Again, another important lesson, especially for marriage, is when you've forgiven your spouse of something, don't ever bring it up again. Amen. I don't care if they do the same thing that they've done before. If they were repentant and you forgave them, don't bring it up again. Don't say, you're doing what you did. Look, you forgave them for that already. Just deal with what's going on at the moment. Amen. It's wicked to just keep bringing this stuff up. When you've forgiven them, you've forgiven them. Right. It's done. Do you, exp do you want God to bring up to you when you've repeated a sin in your life yep. that you've asked for mercy for and you've asked for forgiveness from and for him to go, well, you did this already before. You think, do you really want God doing that with you? Then don't do that to other people. If you don't want to be held to that standard in God's eyes, don't hold other people to that when, when, when they're seeking forgiveness from you, when they're, you know, needing that forgiveness. Because God will deal with you the same way. Very important teaching, something that, that we need to, to take to heart and get our hearts right and humble. And if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to have these types of an attitude. One, to be able to get over yourself, be able to forgive. You're not required to just forgive everybody just for everything when anybody does you wrong. But when they're repentant, when they're sorry, then yeah, you know what? You forgive them. We are expected to do that. But let it be genuine. Don't keep bringing this stuff back up again. It's about as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the, the great teaching that we can receive from your word. God, help us to, uh, to be better, to, to, to be humble and to stay humble, Lord, and not to allow ourselves to get lifted up with pride. God, I pray that you please help us to serve and be ministers unto others. We, we do have a desire to be, to be great in the kingdom of God, Lord, and, and we, we're asking for you to use us, to use us mightily to help other people. Lord, help our hearts to to be one that's focused on serving others and not ourselves. And um, God, just help us to be able to, to forgive and, and to um, just deal righteously in whatever the situation is and be able to deal righteously with, with our brothers and sisters in church here and uh, deal righteously with, with people who have, uh, when there's conflict, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.